Yo guys, welcome back to another video. So today we're talking about stocks versus real estate and more importantly, should you invest into Singapore property? The benchmark for stocks should be the S&P 500 ETF or index fund but there's nothing much to talk about or dissect when we're talking about the S&P 500 ETF. So instead, I'm going to give you guys 7 options of investing into Singapore properties and mainly this is targeted at people who already have their first pot of gold and I'm going to be using 380,000 Singapore dollars as the capital for investing into Singapore properties. So you might have a lower amount or a higher amount and you can adjust that accordingly. I think the key things to take away is actually the concepts and reasoning behind each option. I'm ranking them from worst to best and I think it is mostly quite clear cut that as we move up into better options that your returns will likely be better as well. It all depends on how much knowledge you have and I don't believe in everyone having a different option that is best for them. I believe in there being good options ranked and it depends on how much you're willing to sacrifice and how much knowledge you are willing to acquire to reach the better option. So now let's start with option number 7. Okay and so for the 7 options, only one of them is actually applicable to foreigners and the rest of them is actually mainly for Singaporean. Basically if you're going to pay additional buyer stamp duty as a foreigner then I do not think that investing in Singapore property is actually smart. However of course if you do not understand stocks and if you do not have any other opportunity cost in investing then maybe of course you can consider Singapore properties. So I'm actually basing off all seven options based on what I'm going to do next on my current property. So I'm going to imagine that we are all in the same scenario and I'm sure it will make sense once I start explaining every single option. So option number one is to not sell my current property and first we need to understand what actually makes property a close contender to investing in stock and that is because of leverage. Basically when you buy a property you only need to put a certain percentage upfront as down payment and the rest of them you use as leverage. And if you're not going to use leverage to your advantage when buying a property then I think it is quite clear cut that maybe you should just invest in the S&P 500 instead of a property. So this first example will actually illustrate why leverage is important in property and how it actually increases your potential return. Okay and so first thing how did I get 380k as the control for the 7 options? It's because I actually bought my property at 106,000 around 5 to 6 years ago and right now in the open market it is selling at right around 450,000 so that would mean 254,000 in profit or cash and 130k in CPF and for the non-Singaporeans you can basically just use this CPF as money that you can only use to buy residential property. So Singapore is actually a very unique country that sells property at a huge discount to its citizens when comparing it to the open market. So essentially, the downside risk is very very little and if the market remains stable, then you can stand a chance to earn a sizable profit. So my equity inside this property is at $380,000 which means that I'm only leveraging $66,000 due to the fact that the property in the open market is at 450 k and unlike private properties in Singapore, we can't actually take out an equity loan on our HDB. So the only way to actually increase your leverage on a property such as the HDB on my property is to actually sell it and buy another one. The cost for doing so is actually paying a 4% buyer stamp duty. On average, if it's a lower quantum, then it's lesser. If it's a higher quantum, then it's more. And now I will explain why leveraging is actually so important when buying a property. So when you pay 29% upfront, 25% is the down payment and 4% is the buyer stamp duty. And when we include the bank loan leverage of 75% of the, per of the purchase price, when you buy the 450k property on an open market, you're only paying upfront $130,000. So if the property goes up by 50k, you would have made 38% on your $130,000. But for example, if I choose not to sell and I keep my current property, if it goes up by 50k, I would have only made 13% on my money. So essentially, if I sell my property right now and buy my neighbor's property, which is very very similar to my own, I would have at least 200k cash excess. And if I use that to invest in, for example, the S&P 500, and let's say it generates a 10% historical return on average, it would mean that I would be generating an extra 20k per year 
and this is only in simple interest we're not including the compounding effect that would take place basically after about a year i would net off the four percent buyer stamp duty that i paid to re-leverage my property or re-leverage my money and from the second year onwards i would basically be making an extra 20k per year on average of course so this is obviously the worst option that is to not sell and to keep your property unleveraged and the equivalent of doing something not that smart is actually to for example buy a 450k property and paying upfront $380,000 and only leveraging $66,000. Of course, yes, I'm excluding the interest payment on the loan, but even if let's say we net off the 4% on our 200K cash over here, we would still be making an extra $12,000 instead of $20,000 per year, which still obviously makes sense. Okay, and so to sum up the worst option that you can do is actually to not sell and to not do anything with your current property if you own one that is as under leverage as the one in this example. So let's move on to option two. So option two is very similar to option one, whereby you hold an under leveraged property, but you have plans to buy, but you have plans to sell the property once your new one arrives. And basically applying for another government apartment or another BTO. So I have used this BTO option called Urban Rise at Woodlands as the development for this example. And basically it include five years build time and five years minimum occupation period, time required to wait before you can sell. We would have a total of 10 years. You would essentially be waiting a total of 10 years to earn approximately 200 k which is $20,000 a year. This option is assuming you're not comfortable to actually invest in stocks. And if you are comfortable in investing in stocks, you can go ahead and factor in the stocks return that you would get after selling your initial or first property and add the five years of extra capital gains that you would get on average while waiting for the time to sell the next property. So other than excluding the fact that you can also invest the extra profits after selling the first property, one failure, in balloting would result in around 5,000 to 6.6k in loss and more if you calculate it on a compounded basis and if you also factor in the time it takes to get the profits from your first property to invest into stocks then of course each failure of balloting is worth more. Actually to sell and purchase a private property that is a tree bidder I actually took a real example from property guru and you can see that this tree bidder condo is going at 1.28 million so for this 1.28 property we can see that the loan amount is 960k with an interest rate of 4% and a loan tenure of 30 years the monthly mortgage that you're paying is $4,583 this is the recent transacted for the rental and we will take 4,000 to be conservative for the monthly rental that we can receive and based on the loan of $960,000, we can see that the interest we pay per year, the interest that we pay is actually $36,000 in the first year. And the principal that we will receive or that is left for us to get is only $16,000 for the first year. So 1.28M condo, the down payment is $371,000. Our gross rental yield is 3.75% or 48k in gross rental. And on average, Singapore's property appreciates at around 4% per year. But due to its older lease, I am just going to take it as 3% per year on average for this property. And of course, this is just a rough estimation. It is also possible to get a higher capital appreciation rate or a lower capital appreciation rate depending on how well you can actually value a property and whether you're purchasing an overvalued one or an undervalued one. So our loan interest is 4% and basically our cash flow is negative $500 a month. If we deduct our monthly mortgage to the gross rental of $4,000 a month, of course we are excluding other miscellaneous things like for example maintenance fee of the private property and whatnot, we will get 11.5k in profit from the rental. And if we factor in the average 3% capital appreciation per year, we will get roughly around 48.9k of, year, of yearly gains per year. But actually, if you need to stay in the property, it will mean that we are deducting the 48k gross rental and it will mean that we are only profiting basically $900 a year, which is actually quite pathetic. So that is why this option is actually ranked the third worst option four is actually to sell your current property and to buy a very similar one 
which I have already briefly mentioned in the first example, where you sell and buy a similar one and then you invest in stocks, basically. So if we sell a property and buy a similar one, basically incurring just the 4% buyer stamp duty tax, we would have around 200k in cash. And if we and 200k in cash is actually being conservative, including all the miscellaneous fees, transaction fees, and as well as a light renovation for the unit that you're moving into, you would have an excess of 200k in cash. And 200k in cash actually becomes 500 and 18k in 10 years. If we use the compound interest calculator, we can see that 200k given 10 years to grow at a 10% rate of return, we get a future value of 518k, which means 318k in profit in 10 years. And we are excluding any potential rental that you can have from buying the similar property over here, as well as excluding any capital appreciation on the property that you are purchasing. So let's now move on to the fifth option. And from this point on, I think all the options are actually very viable, especially if you do not know how to invest in stocks or are not comfortable to invest in stocks and you are basically not willing to acquire that knowledge, then property or these property options are actually very viable. So basically, if property is the only mode of investment for you, you want to maximize your capital outlay and basically deploy all your capital as much as possible to get the maximum returns. And basically, I would suggest if you have 380k to purchase two one bader condos. And of course, this is um, in the case where you have a partner, a husband and wife. If not, the next option would be suitable if you are a single person. If we assume a capital appreciation rate of 4% per year, it would bring it to around 26k per year. And at, a, and at an interest rate of 4%, your monthly mortgage is 2.3k. We are cash flowing a positive $400 a month, but of course we are also excluding maintenance fees and other fees. So it is likely uh, more towards break even, but we're just going to keep everything simple and just take gross rental minus monthly mortgage. So we have a positive 400 a month. Our interest payment on the loan on average for the first five years is 18.5K and our profits from gross rental minus interest payment on the loan is 13.5K. And if we add and if we add up the capital appreciation of 26K per year and the profits from rental at 13.5K, we get a total of 39.5K of yearly gains per year. However, if we are staying in the property, meaning we are not renting it out, we are only getting a profit of 8k per year. Because we would take the capital appreciation of 26.5k per year on average, deducting the interest on the loan of 18.5k, we get 8k. And so this is just for one property with a down payment of 188k. And if we include the second one, we would get 79k if we are renting out both. And if we are staying in one and renting out one, we would be profiting an average of 47.5k per year. And this sixth option is actually to purchase a HDB, which in my opinion is more worth it at the same quantum versus a private property. And also to purchase another commercial or industrial property at the same quantum of basically in option 5, if you prefer to have a one bader studio instead of a HDB, you can do that as well and swap it out uh, for the HDB. But in my opinion, in a general basis, of course, um, there will be condos that are more worth it than HDBs or private properties that are more worth it than government properties. But in general, I would say that HDBs are of better value when compared to condo at the same quantum. And one extreme upside I see to this option is actually to possibly start a company and have more loans. However, do not quote me on this because I have never done this before, but I think it is an option to explore. And I think the only drawback is that uh, for commercial or industrial properties, that it is slightly harder to understand than residential properties. So if you're not willing to acquire the knowledge, then maybe you can just stick to residential properties. And also you will not have the option to stay in, in the property. So that could be a downside as well. And finally, let's get to option seven, which I think is the best. And I think I would actually have went for this option if I do not know how to invest in stocks, which is to actually purchase a 2000 square feet HDB and to chop it up into half and basically having one side being a two bader and one side being a three bader. I took a real example as well for this property price at $1 million, 2,066 square feet, 
it is a 99 year leasehold property and it is slightly on the older side having its built finish year at 1994 if our loan amount is 750k and if we use a HDB loan of 2.6% at a loan tenure of 25 years, then we will only need to pay $3,400. And I think using a HDB loan on a huge quantum property is actually a very, very good thing because the market rate or the bank loan rate is actually 4%-ish and you're saving 1.4% of interest every single year is 2450 but let's take 2300 to be conservative and the lowest rental rate for a three bedroom hdb is 3000 but let's use 2700 to be conservative and it will give us a gross monthly rental of 5000 if we add 2.3 plus 2.7 and it would mean a yearly gross rental of 60k per year which is a 6% gross rental yield and and let's assume a capital appreciation rate of 2.5% just due to the fact that it has an older lease. In real life, I do not think this is the case. Um, it may actually have a higher capital appreciation rate due to it having a higher gross rental. But let's just be conservative. So the good thing about this property is that after your minimum occupation period where you can rent out the whole flat, if we take $5,000 of gross rental minus the monthly mortgage of 3.4k, we get a positive cash flow of 1.6k a month, which is not easy to find in Singapore, where properties usually have a neutral cash flow or a negative cash flow. Unless, of course, the remaining lease is very short. However, in this case, the remaining lease is around 68-ish years, which is still pretty long. And if we stay in, let's say, the smaller side of the property and rent out the bigger side for 2.7k, our monthly outflow of cash is 900 and if we stay in the bigger side and rent out the smaller side, then we would have a negative cash flow of 1.3k. So I think not only does this give you a lot of flexibility in choosing which side you want to stay and possibly switching over to the other side. Um, for example, if you stay in the two bedroom side when you had no kids and then suddenly you have kids and then now you need to stay in the three bedroom side, you can still do that without switching out properties as well as yet at the same time, you can also convert it into a full 2000 square feet house if you choose to and also you are only using up one name so if you have a partner, then your partner can go and buy another residential property without actually incurring extra taxes like the additional buyer stamp duty tax. So this option for me is actually highly recommended for myself, of course. I'm not giving advice, but it is just my opinion that I think this option is actually pretty damn good. If I do not know how to invest in stocks, I would definitely go for this. Okay, and before sharing with you guys the option that I'm going for, I'm going to share with you guys a bonus option. Um, my current monthly mortgage is around 500 and if I rent out the place for 2.5k, which is um, pretty damn conservative already, we would have a positive cash flow of 2k and if we take the extra 2k we can go and for example stay in thailand with uh, very little worries and you can work on your craft for example start a youtube channel you can um, start your online business and whatnot or if you can actually work from home or work from anywhere in the world then you can just go there and just chill have a lower have a lower cost of living and yet at the same time have a positive cash flow of extra 2k which you can invest and spend and do whatever you want with the extra 2k so that's the bonus option and lastly, I'm going to share with you guys the option that I'm going to pick, which is basically option 4 with a slight twist to it. So just a quick recap, this is option 4. You can read it if you want, pause the video. But basically for the next property, I'm going to purchase as low a quantum as possible with of course some creature comforts like a bigger space as well as a better location. And I'm going to make use of the excess cash and invest it into individual stocks because I think that would yield me the maximum return. Because to me, assets are all the same and when I compare property to stocks, the gross rental is basically the revenue of the property and the net rental is basically the earnings or the cash flow of a stock. And there are many companies with a PE ratio of 10 or under and if we convert the equivalent to rental yield, it is basically having a PE of 10 is basically a rental yield of 10%. And personally for me, if I wouldn't leverage to buy a stock at a PE of 10, then I wouldn't also want to leverage to buy a property that has basically a gross rental yield of right around 5%, or if we convert it into stocks, it would be a PE of 20. So I'm just actually going to see buying a property to stay in 
not as an asset but basically as an expense. So to conclude, I think we really need to take in the opportunity cost that we have when purchasing a property, especially when purchasing or stretching out your budget to purchase as big a property as possible. I think it is easy to think that property prices will always continue to rise um, if we have only been in the market for like let's say the past 10 to 12 years, 13 years, or if we basically have very short memory and think that um, like basically no crash is coming or that property prices will always continue to go up forever because there is a lot of risk in leveraging onto an asset or rather over leveraging onto an asset um, when there is a chance that it actually drops. Should you invest into Singapore property? I think the answer really depends on how deep your knowledge is into investments and how well you're actually able to value assets. If you do not know how to invest in stocks and property is your best, option then obviously you should invest into Singapore property however if for example you know how to invest into stocks you know how to value them you have confidence in your ability then it is likely I feel that stocks will do better than property especially when compared to where the general Singapore market is at I think there are very little to no undervalued opportunities in terms of an asset when we're looking at Singapore properties however I think that there are still a lot of undervalued stocks out there in the stock market So I think it really depends on the depth of your knowledge on investing. And for those of you who are comparing between HDB and condo, I think the main difference is that HDB you're unable to take out an equity term loan which would affect the amount of leverage that you have on a property in let's say 10 years time or 5 years time. Um, the amount of leverage that you have on the property slowly, slowly decreases and with no ability to take an equity term loan, in the very, very, very long run, HDB will always lose out to condo. However, right now, the market condo is in general overvalued when compared to HDB. However, I think both is overvalued. One is just even more overvalued. And I think in recent times, a lot of people are into new launches and in my opinion i think it is an even worse of an overvaluation when compared to the private property market in general and of course when things goes well in a bull market everybody is a genius um but when you're leveraging so much onto a property and if that is let's say 70 percent or 80 or even 90 percent of your net worth um, then it becomes very very dangerous and you just need one wrong move or one wrong time and it will have very lasting effects um, throughout your life basically. So in my opinion, I think we should buy what we can comfortably afford and not overstretch our budget and I think we should always protect the downside and the upside will basically take care of itself. Um, But if we go and speculate into things that have so-called high risk, high return, then it is likely or it is possible to end up really badly. For me, the protection of downside really, de- for me, the protection of downside really is dependent on the rental. And I believe I have videos on how to actually value a property um, on my YouTube channel. So if you want to take a look at that, you can take a look at that. So the goal for my channel is actually to help people maximize their hard-earned money and maximize the return on their capital in order to achieve financial freedom faster. So if you're into that, then do subscribe for upcoming videos. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.